So I would like to tell you today about adiabatic magnetic deceleration work that we conducted here in Weizmann Institute in recent two years. So I will start with presenting our group and uh, here you see the pictures of our students that were involved in the project. First of all, Itai, he is the first PhD student to join us, Sasha, Alon, Itamar, Liron, and you also see a picture of Julia. She is my wife and she's an electrical engineer that contributed a lot to the project. So first of all, what are we looking for? We are looking for a general way to cool atoms and molecules. Why do we want that? There are two issues that we want to address. So one is precision spectroscopy. By having a cold matter, we can increase the resolution, the spectral resolution of many measurements. That's a very simple statement. Now, what has been already done, so the most prominent experiment, of course, probably is done by Juni group, was deceleration of OH radical and conduct microwave spectroscopy to study time variations of fine structure constant. Another interesting experiment takes place in Hench's group in Munich, where they measure the simplest of all atomic transition, 1s, 2s hydrogen. Now the interesting thing is that they are limited right now by the only systematic, that is the second order Doppler effect, and in principle having colder and slower atomic hydrogen would contribute to this experiment as well. Now, the second application, which of course is also very interesting, especially for us, is chemistry. And that's a picture of a dream, of course. That's a theory paper published by the group of Roman Krems that shows you a cross-section of O2, O2 collisions at ultra-cold temperatures. These are micro-Kelvin collisions. What is interesting from my point of view? You see collision cross-section as function of magnetic field. And what do we see? We see that cross-section can be manipulated by orders of magnitude. Oh, and what is here? Of course, resonances. Every time we pass a resonance, we have, in, for example, enhancement of few orders of magnitude in collision cross-section. Why it is interesting for me? Here you are. You are doing precision spectroscopy without even laser, by collisions. So that really excites me, and uh, that's one of the reasons we are looking after going cold. But here's the problem. How do we cool atoms or molecules? And there is a canonical method, of course, Laser cooling works very well on uh, mainly alkali atoms, something that looks like hydrogen, two-level systems. Unfortunately, it cannot be applied to anything more complex than alkali or earth alkali. So they're really pretty much useless for cooling molecules. OK, so if you don't have anything like that, we are thinking about very general methods of cooling. And the most general method to cool things is using a refrigerator. And it's exactly the idea behind buffer gas cooling. How does the buffer gas cooling work? You take a refrigerator, a cryogenic refrigerator, the Lucian refrigerator, that cools down a helium to 50, 500 millikelvin. You introduce anything into that chamber, and it will thermalize to the temperature of buffer gas. So very simple, on paper, very simple experiment. But you are stuck with your cold matter inside of the the Lucian refrigerator, which limits any experiment we can make further. OK, so let's move on. Other way to cool down things is to let them expand, adiabatic expansion. Exactly as so how the universe is expanding and it's cooling down, exactly the same thing happens in a expanding gas. <coughs> so that is the supersonic beams that we are using as a platform for our experiments. What is a supersonic beam? As I told you, it's nothing more than adiabatic expansion of high pressure gas into vacuum through a small aperture. Now, the remarkable thing of this technique, which is already 50 years old at least, and used in chemistry in so many papers that they don't even know what is the number, is the amazing efficiency of cooling process. You start with a room temperature gas, let it expand, and you finish with the temperatures of tens to hundreds of milli Kelvin. So here you are. And really, the expense is nothing. It really costs you nothing. What is the problem? Of course, no free lunch. So although we do cool down very efficiently, all of the enthalpy that is lost in expansion goes into kinetic energy. So again, numbers. Everything is numbers. We have 50 milli Kelvin beam, very cold, but it moves. If you look at the green curve on the speed distribution, you see a very narrow peak. That is the supersonic beam speed distribution. You see that it moves around 1,800 meters per second, almost 2 kilometers per second fast. 
So that's a little disappointing because supersonic beam, as I told you, is a perfect platform. We can entrain, we can put other atoms, other molecules inside and let them cool. So they thermalize exactly as we do in buffer gas cooling, they thermalize within a supersonic expansion. But here's the problem. Now we have it cold, we have it intense, we have it dense, but it just zooms through our laser fields or our traps with amazing velocities. So what do we do? We want to control the velocity of a supersonic beam. How do we do it? We are not the first to do it. It's already 10 years that people are investigating the problem of controlling the mean velocity of supersonic beam. One of the first experiments was done in Myers Group in Berlin now. There's a big institute that is working on this technology. So he's using, so again, we need a handle. So what handle does he have on matter? He's using dipole moment. So polar molecule has a dipole moment. It has a Stark effect. And using Stark effect, Meyer was able to decelerate polar molecules. Now, when I was a postdoc with Mark Raisin at the University of Texas at Austin, we did the magnetic analog of the same device. Let me tell you just on very, very few slides, how does it work? It's a very, very simple approach. How does the experiment look? We start with a supersonic valve. So from here, we pulse, we release puffs of very fast, few hundred meters per second gas, which is very cold, in, in the moving frame, and we pass it through a series of solenoids. Now, what is the handle that we use? We use spin. Electronic spin. So anything that has a permanent magnetic moment, and most of the atoms are paramagnetic, a lot of radical molecules are paramagnetic, we will be able to catch with magnetic fields. How do we do it? So that was our first idea in 2007. And that really follows very closely the lines of Stark decelerator. And what do we start with? Uh, let's see. I start with laser pointer, but it still works excellent. So a canonical Zeeman diagram. So energy of some, say, spin one half particle with a magnetic field. So we have a splitting, we have low field seeker, and let's have a look at what low field seeker does when it uh, moves through the axis of a solenoid. What do I show here? It's just a magnetic field of a solenoid, axial magnetic field, as a, a function of propagation coordinate. So what do we create? Solenoid, we pass current, we create a magnetic hill just a speed bump for atom or molecule. We move in, we lose kinetic energy. If we do nothing, we gain it back. Conservative system, nothing too interesting. What do we do? We wait until it reaches some point on the barrier and suddenly switch off a magnetic field. What happens? We lose kinetic energy equal to the Zeeman shift at the place where we switch the magnetic field off. Sounds, of course, very nice, easy. What's the problem? Numbers, as usual. So if you compare the Zeeman shift at the magnetic fields, and we reach magnetic fields of 5 Tesla, it's still very small comparing to the initial kinetic energy. What does it mean? It means that we need a lot of stages in order to decelerate. And we are using, we used in, at Austin 64 of these solenoids, the cascaded solenoids, in order to decelerate here, for example, paramagnetic beam of molecular oxygen. So what we show here is a time of light picture. We, s we sit on the detector and count oxygen molecules arriving at different times. So this curve is oxygen, just a direct beam doing nothing. And then you see that we can choose different portions of that beam and decelerate to different velocities. So starting velocity was around 400 meters per second. And we arrived to 80 meters per second. It's all nice. But when I came back to Weizmann, we looked at this problem again. We were very disappointed. What's the disappointment here? Efficiencies. The efficiencies of this method of star decelerator are very low. And the reason is completely clear and trivial. So how do we decelerate? We give momentum kicks in one direction only. What is the problem? When we decelerate and the mean velocity becomes off the order of radial velocity, there is nothing to hold the beam in place. So it just escapes. How well it escapes, the starting density of a supersonic expansion set the first coil easily 10 to, 10, 10 to 11 molecules per cc. What people were able to trap 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. So that's how bad is this loss. Why it's so bad? Now if you want to do any collisional experiment, we can just altogether forget about it. The densities are way too low. So here's the question. How do we decelerate better? Funny enough, we knew the answer in 2007. We had no idea how to do it. 
The answer is very simple. Instead of giving kicks, forget about kicks. Make it simple. Create a trap, three-dimensional trap, that moves, say, 500 meters per second, and then start decelerating, slowly, slowly. So you don't lose anything, okay? So in principle, if the deceleration is slow enough, and you are always trapped, you will lose nothing at all. Simple. What's even better, <clears throat> there are canonical, so here what they show, this is a canonical magnetic trap. Every atomic physics experiment that includes cold atoms has this configuration, this is called anti-Helmholtz configuration of coils, as a magnetic trap. It works super simple, so you have two coils, currents run in opposite, in opposite direction, exactly in the middle, fields from two solenoids cancel out, exactly to, ze to zero. So here is the magnetic field, axial magnetic field, of this uh, configuration, of the Santa Helmos. Exactly the same happens actually in all directions. So it's a 3D trap for a low field seeker seeking an atom or a molecule. Excellent, we know how to create a trap. Now, the only question that is left is how to translate it, how to move it. And don't forget, we need to move it 500 meters per second. So no mechanics. Feasible? Well, yes. Two pounds than one. Again, cold atoms, group of a Ted Hench again. What did we do? They translated cold atom, a cloud of cold atoms over distances of 20 centimeters, even more, 33 centimeters in a few seconds. How did we do it? Very simple. So what you see here, you see pairs of coils. So this is one trap. Second trap is shifted. Third trap is shifted even more. Fourth, and so on. So it's just a sequence of overlapping coils. Now by timing the current in each one of these traps, you can move the center of the trap along that line. It's very simple. As usual, run the numbers. OK, so what is the acceleration value that uh, Hench needs? Well, he doesn't need any acceleration because his atoms are already trapped. Zero mean velocity. So the accelerations are, to say the least, modest at less than one meter per second squared. We have a beam moving at 500 meters per second. We want to stop it in a meter. We arrive at accelerations of 100 1,000 meters per second squared. So 100,000 more deceleration is needed. It took us quite a lot of time. So 2007, we knew the answer. 2010, we have experiment running. So how does it work? It's similar. In approach is similar. Technical is, of course, very diff different. So here is the sort of one section of our decelerator. What they show here, these are sequence of overlapping coils. And what do we do? We control current in each trap so that we can effectively move the trap position. So what you see, you see the blue portion, blue section, which is the trap, is moving from right to left. And now I'll move it back here. So by correct switching sequence, we can control the linear velocity of a moving magnetic trap. Look at the numbers. So again, high deceleration, what does that mean? That means that we need to create very large magnetic gradients. So we reach, for example, on barrier, a height more than the Tesla magnetic fields. So this picture was taken about a year ago, year and a half ago. At the time, we still didn't have a lab. We were somewhere in the corner in the Paramount building. And again, we came back to square one, developing everything from zero. So we started developing new electronics needed to drive these uh, quadruple traps. Uh, this is the first actual setup that we have. And just to show you, we have a really neat way to know what we are making. So we have a very beautiful way to measure a magnetic field as a function of position and time using a Faraday effect. I won't go into details, but I will show you the result of that me measurement. So here what you will see, you will see the real measurement of our real traps moving in time and place. So what you will see, well, what you will see actually, You will see here, first of all, we will see that we switch on a single trap. So you see that these two barriers grow up. So that's one trap. Wow. Easy. Wow. Phew. Well, I, <laughs> Ruben, if I, I'm too close to you, tell me. <laughs> Excellent. So here we are. So first of all, what you will see, you will see that these barriers grow. And then you will see that the trap position starts moving. So this is when we start overlapping between different coils. And the whole move, it takes around 20 microseconds, and it moves over 15 millimeters. 
So it's just a f uh, free of our overlapping uh, coils. So where it is? Here. The switch on, you go up, and you start moving. The nice thing, of course, that you see that there's very little variation on potential, which is important, so we don't heat up our molecules. Also, for, for atomic physicists, it's already very pretty hot. But now, so that's number one. Second, a technical detail, but important. We don't want to just hold them running at 500 meters per second. We want to decelerate. So that's number two. So what we need to do, we need to be able to control the length of the overlapping current or uh, magnetic field pulses. And this is what we do. We are changing the time constant of these uh, current pulses, which are pretty high. So it's the peak is around 500 amps amperes. This is what enables that to happen. So everything is home built. We develop our electronics in-house. And just to show you, now the principle becomes completely simple. So in order to explain you our efficiencies and why our method is, works that well, all I need to do is to look at the potential in two frames. First of all, I will show you in the lab frame. And second, I will move into accelerating frame of reference. So in the lab frame, we have our magnetic rapids asymmetric. We have a barrier, which is about one Tesla high. Then we move into the decelerating frame. We've, had a, we've had a fictitious force. What does it do? The fictitious force takes a potential and tilts it down. So what happens to the front barrier? It becomes smaller. So the higher we have initially our barrier, of course, larger phase space uh, volumes we will be able to trap in the moving in the decelerating trap. So that's a very simple story. Now just to show you a few pictures of our setup. So here, that's sort of artist's view of our chamber. So again, very simple. We have the source, skimmer, coils. This time, actually, another positive thing. We are outside vacuum. There is nothing inside the vacuum anymore. So very simple setup and the detector. So again, we shoot, decelerate, and measure. A few pictures, again. This is what you get when you join Weinstein Institute. They're really very generous, and uh, we get really beautiful labs. So that's January. But that's the last time that my lab, uh, lab was clean, unfortunately. So this is what we have from CAD to real world. So this is all in uh, computer-aided design. This is in real world. This is how it looks today. What you see here, this is where we generate the beam. This section is the decelerator itself, and this is the detection chamber. This is a compact system. This is a close-up. This is where atoms and molecules are moving inside of the tube that you don't see from one chamber to another. All of the coils, electronics, of course, in vacuum. This is a tie working. And the first results that we got, we started getting results somewhere in May. Now we have uh, analyzed everything, and we are uh, finishing our writing our first paper on the new method. And just to show you a glimpse of, what, of what, what we're able to do. So again, what you don't see here at all, by the way, is the initial beam. It's just too low. And this, these are different velocities. So now what we do, we catch in a moving, tra a moving trap and decelerate. And you see that we are able to go from 450 meters per second down to 55 meters per second. Basically, all of the kinetic energy is removed. The only lo additional loss that we see is due to expansion to the detector. But that's a trivial loss. We know how to take care of that. So if I estimate efficiencies, we're pretty not so bad. So we're around 30% efficient. And we will be able to transfer that number also into traps. So we are gaining here probably a few orders of magnitude and density. And that remains to be seen. And that's the next thing that we will do. So we will trap, check what we have, and see whatever cooling methods we can apply to go from millikelvins down to microkelvins. So that's one thing. Second, we are also starting to build now a new experiment where we cross two decelerated beams. So we are thinking of performing reactions between atoms and radicals, 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 in temperatures less than a Kelvin. And uh, that hopefully we will do, hard to say how fast, but this is our plan. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>